Here is Tiny Tim with you. Tiny Tim, would you sing us a song? Uh, there is nothing usual about Tiny Tim. <laughs> yes, me, I think the guy is nutty enough. the fruit case. If you knew you were dealing with a 17-year-old, age means nothing. I reject the fact that you're making fun of Jesus Christ. I'm not making fun of Jesus. Yes, you are. I'm not. You're mocking his name. You don't believe in him. His doctor literally told him he might die on stage. That was the most viewed late-night show in the history of television. This is the story of Tiny Tim. I feel like someone from Mars coming to Earth. Long, long ago, someone I... When I was three years old, I remember him singing a song called Beautiful Ohio. And uh, that melody and his rendition of it, which was the, during World War I, always stuck with me and I was always attracted to that. Not only to those type of records, but to the medium of which a voice can come out of a box like that. Mm -hmm. There's some rapport between myself and the phonograph. I actually feel like the Victor dog because I'm sitting there alone at night and no one's around. I'm just putting my ear into the horn and, uh, and just looking at the record label and hearing the voice come out. Who else influenced you in, in the early years? If you're my age, you've probably heard his music on Spongebob. Maybe you remember this song. Today, Tiny Tim is considered kind of a misunderstood folk hero from the 60s. An eccentric, experimental musician emerging from New York's Greenwich Village folk scene, who briefly befriended Bob Dylan and George Harrison. We have a special guest here this evening. Mr. Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim's androgynous style and his seeming challenging of gender norms can be cited as being an early beacon for queer identity. He appeared frequently on television in the late 60s and early 70s, displaying a unique combination of frenzied mania and introverted vulnerability, with audiences and hosts either not being able to tell if he was joking or not, or openly mocking him for his strangeness. Many appearances feel eerily similar to the plot from the film Joker. Ten, one, and two. I really do, you know, I really take everything serious. It doesn't matter if they laugh or howl or, you know, be serious themselves. But everything I do, I always, you know, take it seriously uh, to myself. If you eat too much, ooh, ooh, you <laughs> Did you feel that you were held up to ridicule? Uh, yeah, well, it, it was tough to get letters. Uh, after the laugh-in show, they said, where'd you get them from? What's happening to the world? The Los Angeles Times said, a low boo to Tiny Tim. Uh, but even though that was rough, <clears throat> I'm not saying it wasn't, sorry. That's the same thing that happened when I had this long hair in 54 around the neighborhood in New York City in Washington Heights. Only this time, it was on a larger scale. It was around the world. Have you ever been asked what your real birth name was? Yeah, it's Herbert Corey. Herbert B. Corey. Growing up, Herbert was considered somewhat odd and introspective. He loved comics and the Brooklyn Dodgers. When he was three, his father began introducing him to Tin Pan Alley music, and Herbert would famously spend hour upon hour cranking the family's Vitrola playing records. The shy Herbert played street ball with the other kids in his neighborhood, but he was often bullied for being too proper and goody-goody. There was the strange, sheltered, kind of bizarre kid growing up, butt of everyone's joke, who really, really, really desperately craved attention. He had a strained relationship with his mother, Tilly. Even well into his career, she never truly embraced or accepted the quirkiness of her son. She always just considered him strange. You know, he always said, oh, but I love my mother. But then he would talk about what she had done to him, how she had really beaten him up psychically. 
I never knew that I had a higher top register. And one day I heard Rudy Valley. Welcome back to Rudy Valley later, as Herbert seemed oddly fixated on this one particular crooner throughout his life. And so he began creating various characters for himself, performing in brightly colored costumes and under a various number of stage names. Among these were Judas K. Foxglove, Texarkana Tex, Emmett Swink, and Vernon Castle. He would switch from his high voice to his low voice. He would do duets with himself. Now, how long have you been going by the name of Tiny Tim? Since 1963. That's uh, one of my many managers who I had at the time. Mm -hmm. He was a great fan of Charles Dickens. Word began to spread around New York about the man with the unique falsetto voice. I did use it in amateur shows where there were a lot of good singers uh, to break the boredom. And it was also at this time that Herbert saw a picture of movie star Rudolph Valentino posing with white powder makeup and long hair. Allegedly, this is what inspired Herbert to grow his hair long and paint his face. Although, over the years, he's given various reasons for this hairstyle. I had this hair in 54 as a gimmick. Half, of it, half a gimmick and half because I thought it fit the style which I was going by. And it seems the style he was going for was this kind of vaudevillian circus look. But unfortunately at home, these were all just considered the antics of a crazy person. It was acting so strange that his mother thought that he should go down to Bellevue, the psychiatric unit down there for an evaluation, to see what was wrong with him. And you have to understand that in those days, when someone said go to Bellevue, they considered you nuts. Fortunately, his father Boutros intervened and prevented this trip to Bellevue Hospital. A few years later, in 1959, Herbert would find work in Times Square, of all places, at Hubert's Museum and Live Flea Circus. It was a kind of amusement park carnival, but according to Herbert, this was actually a sweet gig. And after a few years, he had gained enough exposure to secure himself both a manager and a new audience in various clubs and cafes around Greenwich Village. And this is where we get his first collection of recordings. I was actually singing in subway trains, singing uh, in the streets, in back alleys. You weren't getting paid for this, though, were you? <laughs> no, only in applause <laughs> or hoots. <laughs> I used to run by day and sing at night. There wasn't any vacant time through 1950 to 1967. There was always either a party, there was a nightclub, there was an amateur show, there was a street alley. I was always singing. During this period, Tiny Tim appeared in a smattering of independent films, including Jack Smith's experimental film, Normal Love, as well as the film, You Are What You Eat. In 1967, Tiny Tim met Bob Dylan in the basement of a club called Big Pink. Apparently the conversation went like this. I told Mr. Bob Dylan when I had the pleasure of being with him alone, he asked me, Mr. Tim, tell me about Rudy Valley. And I told him back in 1929, Mr. Valley, one of the greatest early romantic crooners, he was the first Sinatra woman went crazy over him in 1929 when he came on the microphone. And here's how I felt one of his numbers. He also told him, Mr. Dillon, you are today to folk music what Rudy Valley was to romantic music in the early days of radio and records. He proceeded to perform Dillon's Don't Think Twice It's Alright and Like a Rolling Stone in the style of a 30s crooner. Later in his career, Tiny Tim would incorporate a Bob Dylan impression into his act. Mr. Dillon, supposing you were alive in 1929, how would you be singing My Time Is Your Time? My time is your time. Your time is my time. We just seem to synchronize. He also covered Nowhere Man in front of George Harrison himself in his unique style. Oh, hello to you nice Beatles. Uh, it's so wonderful and what a thrill it is talking here uh, in Mr. Harrison's presence, Mr. Weiss's presence, and all his nice, wonderful friends. 
And the thing is, I just want to say Merry Christmas to you all <laughs> and uh, a Happy New Year. <laughs> oh, Thank you, Tony. Right. Would you like to sing us a little song? Oh, I love this. Here's a Ooh. real Noah man living in his Noah land, making all his Noah plans. No. 1966, a talent booker for the Merv Griffin Show spotted him in a New York club and offered him a spot on the talk show. But he was not well received, and I wasn't able to track down this appearance. Mo Austin went to New York to sign Jimi Hendrix, and Tiny Tim was the opening act on the bill. Austin was a shrewd record business veteran. He recognized Tiny Tim's earning potential even as a novelty act. In the fall of 1967, Austin signed the strummer to a record deal. Tiny cut his ties with his manager and moved to Los Angeles to record his first album, God Bless Tiny Tim. The album also featured two covers which would become very prominent fixtures of Tiny Tim's career, including Maurice Chevalier's Living in the Sunshine. But even more famous was his rendition of Tiptoe Through the Tulips. The album was produced by engineer Richard Perry. No one in a million years would have ever thought that Tiny Tim would be able to make not only an album, but an album that I'm very proud to say was revered by the rock intelligentsia, by the public, by everyone. His producer Richard Perry brought him to audition for Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Co-host Dick Martin recalls when Tiny Tim initially auditioned. He walked in in full regalia with his long coat and his uh, shopping bag and walked up to the where we were auditioning and he pulled out the ukulele out of the shopping bag and went into a song. A tisket, a tisket, a green and yellow biscuit. I sent a letter to my mother on the way I brought it. I really make believe that I may hockey goalie in a net. Uh, when the hockey season's on, and when the baseball season's on, I make believe I'm up at bat, uh, and I'm batting in the opposition's part. But even at the height of his fame, Tiny Tim was still trying to be a musical archivist. He was always trying to educate his audience about who exactly wrote these songs he was singing. Maurice Chevalier, Harry Richmond, Billy Murray, Arthur Fields, Rudy Valley, Charles Harrison, Dick Hames, Irving Kaufman, Byron G. Harlan, Burt Williams, Crosby and Jolson, Henry Burr. And he appeared on plenty of other talk show programs other than Rowan and Martin's Laughing, including The Late Show with Johnny Carson in March of 1968. But on April 4th, 1968, Tiny Tim's appearance went almost unnoticed. That morning, Martin Luther King Jr. was gunned down at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. As the news flashed around the world, Tiny Tim was singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips and being interviewed by host Johnny Carson. It no longer seemed like Tiny Tim's chipper and vaudevillian style suited the times. Hey, did you see Yellow Submarine? No, I can't stand Japanese war movies. I love you being tiny. And as his fame grew, so did the stories of his bizarre personal life behind the scenes. One of the managers described at one point going to Tiny's room late at night and became aware of the fact that Tiny was moving from chair to chair, pretending to have a dinner party. He must have been very lonely 
You know what I mean? And then there's the issue of his religion. Ever since he was little, Herbert practiced this kind of fire and brimstone style of Christianity, very fundamentalist, and it definitely influenced his relationships, his marriages, and he was very outspoken about his religious views. Tiny had definite images of what a woman should be and a definite perception of how a woman should be in a marriage relationship. A lot of it uh, came from his own head, some of it came from the Bible. He felt that the woman should be subservient to the man. He found this girl hiding in the shower and she proceeded to uh, pour honey over his entire body and then slowly lick it off. This was okay with him because he wasn't in any way engaging in the sexual act. All my songs, I always go in a dream world and I think of young beautiful angels about 19 years old and, and pure thoughts of cause. And his preference for purity would mean he would always date younger women. So when he wrote a book called Beautiful Thoughts, he went on a book tour. And that's where he actually met his first wife, Vicky, at the young age of 16. His words were, I saw her face and I couldn't get her out of my mind. Tiny arranged a meeting. Within weeks, Tiny Tim and Vicky Buttinger were standing face to face in Atlantic City. The chemistry between the lanky crooner and the nubile teenager was instant. In his typically formal manner, Tiny Tim referred to his new girlfriend as Miss Vicky. Could have been maybe a month, month and a half, and then they were already talking about, you know, getting married. And then later in 1968, Tiny Tim returned to the Johnny Carson show. When he first announced that he had a girlfriend, people assumed, and I think Carson assumed, that she would be a female version of Tiny, and invited him to have her on the show the next time he came on. And he brings out this very pretty young girl, dressed very demurely, and I think people are genuinely shocked. But Tiny always had extremely high standards for female beauty. During the interview, Tiny Tim mentioned the couple's impending nuptials, and it was during the commercial break. Rudy went over to Johnny's desk and whispered in his ear. When we came back from commercial, Johnny turned to Tiny and said, well, why don't you and Miss Vicky get married here? People remember that. That was the most viewed late night show in the history of television. Just right. This was the height of Tiny Tim's fame. Tiny Tim and Miss Vicky's wedding was viewed by over 21 million households on The Tonight Show. Were you abusive during that marriage at all? I only once was trying. I, I could, have lost, uh, could have lost my temper. She knew what Jesus Christ meant, that I didn't believe in cheating. She left me. Uh, there was a letter from somebody in Bermuda, some man she met who wrote to her without my knowing, and she had committed adultery before the marriage. Then one day I had a date. She was ready to go, and then she changed her mind. I said, you're changing your mind now. You're embarrassing me. So basically, of course I get angry there. I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, mean I, I think I was a little justified. And I still wouldn't divorce her because I don't believe in divorce. She got a divorce because the state of Jersey gave it to her in 1977 when I couldn't afford to come up there. If you could talk to Tulip right now, what would you say to her? I would say to her, you don't have to call me father because right I wasn't there. So it's very easy to see why Miss Vicky left him. And even though Tiny Tim would remarry several times throughout his life, he would often write that Miss Vicky was his only true wife because he did not believe in divorce. Meanwhile, his career continued to plug along, mostly with appearances on variety shows. He also began singing in a lower register to kind of distance himself from what he saw as a gimmick. He even did a pretty good Elvis. Earth Angel, will you be mine? Well, everyone has feelings, and everyone has emotions. Are you real, Mona Lisa? No. I guess I'm just a cold and lonely, lovely work of art. Tiny Tim's second album was called, appropriately enough, Tiny Tim's second album. 
And even though it was not as well received as his first, it has some really good songs. As I talk with you, it's a heaven so sublime. So naturally, when the real second album came out, to the latter part of 68 in the fall, it didn't move anymore, mm -hmm. and I didn't have a good reputation in the business. And, and then from that, you did the, uh, the, the children's album you did, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that this one wasn't too this good. This was a record that... This, this, this was the worst record in record history. Oh, dear. Uh, apparently, the uh, these people wanted $25,000. This was done in 62. Okay. And when the Tip of the Tools came out in 68, they wanted $25,000 not to put it out. Oh. And you know, Warners wouldn't pay the bribe. And so for a while, it killed me in the business. Oh. Years ago, they said I'd never make it. They tried to stick a pin in my balloon. They said I was too strange, that my dreams were all in vain. <laughs> but they said the same about man on the moon. There are people out there in this business who'll sign everybody up. Uh, especially when they know they're looking for a break. They'll take any talent, good or bad, and sign them to a contract, have the forms printed up at a contract uh, printing office, have a pad and sign them up, and put it in a drawer. They don't know what they're signing, right off the streets and promise them everything, and they'll go into a drawer, you'll never hear from them again. And it should be noted, at this time, Tiny Tim did have a daughter with Miss Vicky, but he was estranged. Her name was Tulip. And Tiny Tim was not supportive, so Miss Vicky was forced to go on welfare. Tiny's appearances began to dwindle more and more. And since Tiny really didn't care how little money he made, he would perform no matter uh, how sparse, perform in second class lounges. He performed in, uh, in motel lounges. He even once played at a trailer park bar. In 1984, Tiny joined the Allen C. Hill Great American Circus. I'm not trying. Has been star singer in the circus at any time who sung half this long. The Wall Street Journal came down and said, how can he travel? I mean, from Las Vegas to the Mud Show, they called it. And I said, frankly, you haven't got the right idea, you know. This is like the last living part of Vaudeville. Going to the promised land, I'm on the highway to hell, I'm on the highway to hell. And during the last phase of Tiny Tim's career, many of his appearances began to feel more like exploitation than opportunity. He appeared as a clown in a horror film. Exactly what this heart said. If you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, honey, tell me so. If you really need me, just reach out and touch me. Come on, sugar, let me know. Baby, cute Tiny Tim. Cut, 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 cut. What are you expecting two days? In two days, you could do all your holiday shopping at Ames. So fun. So fun. And in his attempts to reclaim his former fame, it started to get pretty weird. In 1990, the performer ran unsuccessfully for mayor of New York City. In 1992, he signed on as running mate for perennial presidential candidate, comedian Pat Paulson. While his political efforts failed, Tiny Tim continued to play low-rent venues. His odd behavior became even odder. I use one a day instead of underwear. It keeps me nice and clean. It's so sanitary. I wish the pen would make an elastic underwear like that throwaways up to the waist so I don't have to use those cumbersome straps. He would go through uh, three or four big jars of gefilte fish at a time. And uh, probably uh, six, eight pieces of fish in a jar at a time. And he'd just stick his hands in and pull it out and eat it with his hands and then down it with the, with, the, with the beer. When it appeared the singer's career was at an all-time low, Tiny Tim was invited to be a guest on Howard Stern's radio show. His career really started to change when Howard Stern started inviting him on his show. And that changed a lot because people started to hear Tiny every day and really realized that this was not an act. The appearances on Howard Stern brought Tiny Tim back into the limelight. Until they had a falling out over Jesus. 
Is it hard calling a grown man tiny? How should I know? Well, when was the last time he did the show? See, the day it happened, I had no idea that, that uh, Tiny was into Jesus. And I must have casually said, like, like when you're on the air, you say, oh, Jesus. I said it a couple of times. I don't remember saying that much about Jesus. But something set him off. And he hasn't been on the show since this happened. And it's too bad because this is another guy who's a phenomenal radio guest. He's turned us down at least a half a dozen times since then. This is a man who had just talked about giving a back rub to another man. <laughs> How could we have upset him? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth the way it is. I thank Jesus Christ for saving my soul. And I've gone through the whole rigmarole. All right. This is not mentioned on this show. I understand. Now, I know you're a light, funny show here. Yes. But you should tell your listeners wow. that Jesus Christ does rule my life. And I have sinned like everyone else. But I thank him for letting well, me we would that. if you give us the chance. Right. I'd like to say that. I was about to say it. No, you wouldn't have because you would have talked over me. Jesus, I want to pray to Jesus right now. You know, you've changed me. I want to pray to Jesus if I may. All right. Tiny's Bless getting upset. I think Tiny I, I is getting, getting upset. I, I think I am getting upset because you're taking Jesus Christ's name in vain. Oh. It's one thing to talk about other things, but you're supposed to be normal and on the show, and you're taking his name in vain, and I reject it. I, I despise that. Oh. Oh, wait a second. Oh, when did you do that? I don't know. I'm not oh. sure when. See? I'm going to pray to Jesus now myself. Bless me, Christ. Right. That's right. Bless me, Christ. Right. Put Tiny's ukulele in his mouth, for God's <laughs> if, I, if I can no, say that. I reject the fact that you're making fun of Jesus Christ. I'm not making fun of him. Yes, you are. I'm not. You're mocking his name. You don't believe in him. I do believe no, in him. No, you don't. Well, I oh, kind of well, do. Now can, I Come on, can't Tiny. Even, you can get into an argument with Tiny Tim, how? I don't know. I'm getting nervous here. Oh. At this point, though, his penchant for binge eating and drinking were starting to catch up with him. He was diagnosed with diabetes. But against doctor's recommendations, he continued performing. And he said, I have a show to do in two hours, and I'm going to go play. And uh, he wouldn't listen to the doctor. By now, he was 62. And although his health was deteriorating, his appetite for young women was not. In 1995, the performer met 39-year-old Harvard graduate Sue Gardner in Minneapolis. The fact that when he got married to Miss Sue, I think there was a, it was a turning point in his life. It was the first stable relationship he had. Miss Sue was the best thing that ever happened to him. In 1979, Tiny Tim played When the Saints Go Marching In for about two hours and 17 minutes before he gracefully transitioned into Tiptoe Through the Tulips. Fortunately, doctors revived him, and there's footage of him after this accident in the hospital after he bumped his head. And one short month later, Tiny Tim was performing Tiptoe Through the Tulips for the Women's Club of Minneapolis, Minnesota, when suddenly, he stopped singing. He clutched his chest and staggered off stage. Miss Sue asked him, are you all right? And he said no. Tiny Tim suffered a fatal heart attack and was pronounced dead on arrival. He left behind Miss Sue and an estranged daughter. So where do we place Tiny Tim in our collective conscious? If he were still around today, he surely would have been canceled for all the misogynistic behavior he openly displayed throughout his life. When I started delving into the research for this video, I would have never predicted that this silly man, this eclectic and daring singer from the 60s, would also be such a troubled and kind of disturbing figure at the same time. He longed so much to exist in the past that he had no chance of staying relevant in the future, nor able to stay aligned with basic modern values. To me, he always seemed kind of frustrated in his appearances, like no one is really getting it. He's trying to show them what in his mind is the most beautiful thing in the world, but they just laughed at him or saw him as a kind of curiosity. And it doesn't seem like anyone in his life, except maybe Miss Sue, was able to fully appreciate the sincerity of his pursuit. Since his death, his music has been used not only in cartoons, but also horror films. Vicky, was it love at first sight? Um, it was really love at first fright. No, don't say that! Tiny Tim was a complex, troubled troubadour. He was king for a day, but he suffered a lifetime of defeats.
Regardless, he'll always be remembered best for tiptoeing through those tulips. If there is another 20 years, uh, I think by that time it's all going to be out in space. You think uh, you'll be out there too? Well, I hope I am. I hope I'm with uh, you. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's all going to be out in space. Uh, it's all going to be way up there. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks so much to my patrons over at Patreon. You guys make a big difference and, and make it possible for me to keep doing these videos, so thank you so much. And if you'd like to subscribe, please click below, yada, yada, yada. All right, guys, have a great day. Do you sleep in the nude? No way. <laughs>